Buon pomeriggio a tutti, benvenuti al Pontificio Istituto Orientale e benvenuti anche a, questi, a quelli che sono online. Da nove anni l'Orientale collabora con Longbeard Creative per lo sviluppo delle nostre capacità informatiche. È sempre interessante e piacevole lavorare con Longbeard poiché ha un interesse particolare per la missione evangelitrice della Chiesa. Come per altre università pontificie di Roma, la nostra tecnologia ci permette di offrire i nostri corsi e le nostre conferenze online a una comunità più vasta. E stiamo lavorando a un programma che ci permette di accedere alle migliaia di libri che abbiamo digitalizzato negli ultimi anni. Oggi vedremo due programmi che sono stati creati per agevolare nost la nostra ricerca e per una più ampia evangelizzazione. A mio avviso, questi sforzi sono importanti per due motivi. In primo luogo, la missione della Chiesa in tutte le sue dimensioni non finisce mai e nel nostro tempo è in difficoltà, poiché le chiese e le religioni organizzate hanno perso una certa popolarità. Tuttavia, le persone hanno ancora fame di spiritualità e spesso si rivolgono a internet per trovare risposte e direzioni nella vita. I programmi che vedremo oggi cercano di rispondere a questa esigenza. In secondo luogo, e non meno importante, la Chiesa dovrebbe essere all'avanguardia in tutti i nuovi mezzi che servono alla sua missione. L'intelligenza artificiale è nuova, ma non deve spaventarci, al contrario. La Chiesa dovrebbe avvalersene e trovare il modo di usarla per il bene. La Chiesa non deve essere reattiva, ma proattiva, anzi profetica. La conferenza di oggi si terrà tra italiano e inglese, dopo la presentazione di due programmi di intelligenza artificiale, avremo il tempo di ascoltare i nostri relatori e di porre domanda. I membri della nostra tavola rotonda sono la nostra moderatrice Delia Gallagher, ex corrispondente del Vaticano CNN, il padre Michael Bagot, professore a Regina Apostolorum, il padre Philip Lari, ex professore del Laterano, adesso professore a Boston College degli Stati Uniti, lui è più o meno invisibile, però online da Boston. Alessio Pecorario, ufficiale vaticano, esperto di cybersicurezza e nuove tecnologie, e Matthew Sanders, il capo CEO di Longbeard. E alla fine della conferenza avremo una simpatica sorpresa. Vi propongo un incontro con un bel robot che si chiama Desdemona e che potrà rispondere a tutte le vostre domande e forse sarà un giorno docente qui al Pio. Invito adesso Matthew al microfono. microfono. Matthew will explain the two programs, uh, he and his assistant will explain the two programs that they have developed using artificial intelligence in collaboration with the, with the uh, Orientale. Matthew, the microphone is yours. Well, let me just um, start by thanking Father Nazar and the Orientale for hosting us. It's been a real privilege working with them in this a very interesting domain. I've been ordered by Father Nazar to speak more slowly because I tend to <laughs> typically speak very quickly. So Patrick is going to remind me, my CTO will be speaking shortly if I speak too quickly. So let me just um, start. Father Nazar mentioned uh, that we've developed collaboratively two different um, AI products. One is called uh, Magisterium AI, which some of you have, uh, may have already used. Um, it's, it's very similar to how ChatGPT works. The interface is, is very similar. We built it 
essentially trying to build build the most reliable kind of Catholic AI system that we could using the current technology available to us. And that's that's kind of the mission. Can we find a way to leverage AI in such a way that it can be useful for church and and for mission? Uh, it's been uh, it's been an interesting uh, journey in creating it. We've, we've learned a lot, and there's still a lot more that we have to do. But we felt uh, it's got to a point now where it's being used in, in over 150 countries, um, from everyone to bishops to, uh, to, to high school students. Um, and so uh, we we're seeing real traction, real desire for a product like this. And so that's encouraged us to continue to invest more of our time and energy in developing it. The second product we're going we're to be sharing is, is called uh, Volgate AI. Uh, and it's an AI-powered library platform. So there's, there's two purposes for it. Um, one purpose uh, is to help with the digitization of libraries. So to take uh, scanned library books and using AI, find more efficient ways um, to extract the data and label it so it can be used by and, and queried by an, an AI system. The other part of the platform is basically a, a, a very a straightforward kind of library suite in which you can query, ask a question, and the AI, the, 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 you'll use leverage something called neural search to search the library contents and pull out for you what it considers to be uh, the relevant passages. So Patrick will, will, uh, will demonstrate Vulgate, and I'll just very briefly um, demonstrate Magisterium AI. So what Father Nazar wanted me to do, just to make it a bit more interesting, is to uh, pose a bunch of questions to Magisterium AI in different languages. One of the, the benefits of artificial intelligence is it, it takes a query and it converts it into a mathematical expression, and then it searches um, we call it embeddings or vectors, which are mathematical expressions of knowledge to help bring forward the most relevant results. It's a little bit technical, uh, so it's probably easier to show you than, than further explain. So the first um, question I'm going to ask here is, uh, is in German. Why don't you do one in, uh, in English first? English first? Okay. You want to read that? Probably easier for you, Father David. Funzione di questa, bravo, okay. The Catholic Church has a positive and respectful view of Islam as evidenced by the following key points from the provided references. So you see here one, two, three, four, and five, they all refer to a document of the magisterium. The church regards Muslims with esteem as they worship the one God, the creator of heaven and earth, and submit to his will, just as Abraham did. Then you have a reference, you can go to one or two documents to, to see a more elaborate answer to that. Muslims revere Jesus as a prophet, but they do not acknowledge his divinity, and they honor the Virgin Mary. Again, you have three reference points in three different documents from the, the magisterium. The church recognizes that the Islamic tradition includes many biblical figures, symbols, and themes, and so on. So, and the references will be to uh, Vatican documents, in the languages that the Vatican has provided them. So English is obviously a dominant language. There you can see references to documents, Ecclesia in Medio Oriente, Nostra Etate, uh, and so on. And there you can just pull up any one of the documents and read it more in full if that's the document that re responds to the, your, your research. So English and Italian are the, the languages that we know very well. But let's try that uh, German question. And is there someone here who could read the German question? I think this young chap over here could do that. Get your butt over here. Was denkt die Kirche über die Todesstrafe? What does the church think about the death penalty? So that's the question in German. What does the church think about the death penalty? <clears throat> and once again, this is from like a kind of a Vatican, not the library, but official uh, papal teachings, magisterial teachings. And those are summaries from uh, the various documents. When we go down to the documents, you'll see that the documents are not in German. They're in the languages in which they were promulgated or adequate translations provided by the Vatican. Okay, but Italian, English, German, we're still in Europe. 
We got an, a question in Arabic up there? I do. Somebody here speak Arabic? I think you do. <laughs> this question came from Dalia, a former student of ours in Baghdad. Okay, uh, the question is, قانون الإيمان في مجمع نيقيا the credo in uh, Nietzschea, in the Council of Nietzschea, and the answer in Arabic, I do. I, I love the Lebanese accent when they speak Arabic. So again, you see the same structure there. The summary comes back in the language of the question. And if we go down further, oh, sorry, it'll, it'll give the, the documents from which these, uh, these come. Okay, but I mean, we're all familiar, like, you know, Eastern churches, Arabic, you know. Uh, but let's get the most beautiful language I can imagine at the moment is uh, Chinese. Let's put a question up there in Chinese. And is there anyone here who speaks Chinese? Oh, who's this girl here? Who's this girl here? Uh, the question is, in Christology, the human nature and the divine nature are united in Christ? You can hear the accent comes from northern Taiwan. It's much prettier than from southern Taiwan, this northern Taiwanese accent. So again, the same structure. This shows the power of the program. The summary answers come back in Chinese. But when, when we go to the documents to which they referred, lower down, you'll see there'll, there'll be in English or the various languages, that the Italian, the various languages that the Vatican has published the documents in. Okay. So one of the the main problems you're trying to solve with. When, when ChatGPT first came out, um, one of the concerns was um, it was generating responses but not providing uh, transparency as to where that generation came from. So how do you know that the answer it's generated is actually from the magisterium? So one of the first things we tried to do when we designed this AI system was to make sure there is transparency so that whatever answer is being generated by the AI system, you can see where that generation is coming from. So that's part of the transparency and accountability. The other issue that we've been working um, on is hallucinations. For those of you who are aware of AI systems, one of the, the problems with them is hallucinations. It's like this desire for the AI to, to give an answer even when it really doesn't have one in its, in its knowledge, knowledge base. And so learning how to mitigate hallucinations uh, in the case of Magisterial teaching was one of our main priorities. And through Magisterial AI, a number of techniques I won't bore you with, we've been able to significantly reduce the amount of hallucinations down to a very, very small percentile. And that just ensures, again, that the answers being generated are as reliable as possible. And this is really something that we work on um, you know, every day. Uh, we find every month we're, always, we're able to make some kind of advance in this domain because the number of um, uh, new AI systems and techniques that are coming out are coming out, you know, almost on a, on a daily basis. And so this is very much a, a work in progress. You're kind of seeing a, a version one, but we have much more ambitious plans for it in the future. And with that, I just want to invite uh, my CTO, Patrick Wilson, to do a little demonstration for Volgate. Good afternoon. I'm just going to switch the tab here. So as Father Nazar and Matthew alluded to, uh, Volgate is a library platform which is powered by artificial intelligence. So this is uh, one of the artificial intelligence uh, platforms that we've been building and are very excited about. Uh, that Volgate, it really brings library systems into the next age in the sense that artificial intelligence has uh, new emerging tools which can really be used to help the user friendliness, not only for the users and the students or researchers using the platforms, but also for the people who might be on the admin side ingesting documents. Um, as you might be aware, uh, getting documents into a library platform, or you may not be aware, but it's a very cumbersome process. Uh, with Volgate, we have achieved a way to really speed up that process and make it much, not only quicker, but much more user friendly as well. So without further ado, I will give a brief demo of the platform here. Oh, let me go right back to the dashboard. So what you're seeing here is the dashboard of the Orientalis uh, Volgate platform. So any organization that's onboarded into Volgate will have their own organization with their own set of documents 
and their own user interface, and you can have as many researchers and admins in the system as you'd like. Uh, one of the key features here as well is the ability to cross-reference documents from other uh, institutions as well. So if you have a sharing arrangement with, let's say, um, you know, another university, a neighboring university, or part of, for example, in the Jesuit consortium, the Gregorian, uh, or the Biblicum, <clears throat> you'd be able to share those documents together if you'd like and filter through them. So on this dashboard here, you can see that we have um, the recently viewed documents, recent searches, and saved collections. But obviously, that's not the artificial intelligence stuff. So let me dive right into that, because that's where the fun happens here. So under Query Library, um, and this is uh, uh, to preface as well, the, the main methods in which we use artificial intelligence are, I would say, threefold. One is with uh, really leveling up the queries that you're able to use in the system. Uh, two, with document ingestion, as I'll get into. And then three, with being able to generate summaries of documents. So when it comes to querying uh, a library database, as researchers or students may very well be aware, uh, oftentimes this is difficult to get through an entire library. Where do you start? Well, you know, if it's an omni search, that often doesn't work very well in current iterations. So what we're trying to do here is almost bring the power of a Google search, where you have a single um, box, bring that to Volgate so that, or to a library platform, and get the results that you're expecting. With a lot of library platforms, you might be able to get exactly what you need by doing a very advanced search, filling out a whole bunch of different fields, and then you might even miss the mark a little bit as well if you don't get it exactly right. Whereas with Google, you can be a bit fuzzy with it. You can search something, be somewhat lazy with it, do it quickly, and still expect to get a fairly good result. So that's what we aim for here with Volgate. So just for example, I'll just put in something like early church councils. Now, of course, you can get very granular with this as well, but just for the, the purposes of this demo, we'll keep it simple. So this will come up with all the relevant results here. And as you can see, it's giving me just early church councils, which not only um, is using the keywords, but also the context of early being not late church councils. Um, so you can see here, I have things like Constantinople, Constantinople 1. So I will go into that one here. You might recognize the name on this document here. This is the Encyclopedia Dictionary of the Christian East uh, by Dr. Ferruja. So once this opens up, we get uh, a, the document listing. And this is actually an excerpt from the entire uh, encyclopedia. So it puts you right into that particular excerpt. So it makes it very easy to just dive in right where there's relevant resources and start reading through um, and getting to the information you need. Now, if I wanted to do some work on this, I'll quickly just show a few of the editing features here as well. I could um, do annotations on the document. We also have collaboration features as well for commenting. So for example, I can mark up this text here. I can drop a comment on it as well if I wanted. And then this can be shared similar to uh, Google Docs with other colleagues. And so that it makes it very a collaborative environment, makes it very user friendly to work on documents together or even just annotate uh, documents yourself. Now, let's say I have a very long work or a long uh, summary and I'm in a hurry. And um, I just, I don't need to read through every line. I'm looking for the summary of the work. Uh, we're able to gener or, um, generate a summary here. So this is leveraging the power of AI right within the viewer here. So you can hit generate summary. It should only take usually a few seconds, but you'll quite quickly get a summary of the entire section that you're looking at there. And we're going to be uh, bringing that to entire documents as well. Um, an issue with um, AI right now is context windows because you you can, AI documents or AI systems typically are, are good at processing smaller uh, excerpts or smaller pieces. Large works, they struggle with context. But this is getting better as we, as we you know, every day. So we're continuing to leverage newer and newer technologies as they emerge, and, uh, and that's where we'll be able to really uh, generate accurate summaries of entire works, or let's say outlines, five-page summaries, uh, et cetera, class, um, you know, class rubrics, et cetera. Uh, okay, and lastly here, we have another AI feature. I actually should have mentioned this earlier as one of the three. This is number four, is to be able to generate a translation rate in the system of machine uh, translation. So for example, with this one, I can just click in. And if the source document has been uploaded in multiple languages, uh, we'll see those source translations there. So as you might be aware, many documents might have you know, Arabic and English side by side in the document. 
Uh, if that's the case, then it would show up in the translations here. But if, for example, you want it to read in another language or the source is in a language which you don't understand and you want it to read it in your native language, you can easily do that here and generate a quick um, machine translation. So you can see you have a lot of choices here. And this is uh, the, the cutting edge language translation technology here. So I'm going to choose Greek. Oops, let me try that again. Yeah. Oh, is yeah. it there? Yes. Oh, there, sorry, I was looking on the right side. <laughs> I forgot it switches around. So that now comes into your main pane and you can actually um, mark this up and edit it yourself as well if you prefer to work in the source language. But you also have the English to cross-reference right there. So it makes it very useful for research and, and editing purposes. So those are the editor features in a nutshell there. Uh, so now the next thing I'd like to demo is the document ingestion. So this is where um, the admins or the people that are actually working on getting the documents into the library system will really have an advantage using this. Um, typical OCR or optical character recognition tools that exist are very good at getting the raw data. So it can pull with fidelity the raw data or raw text from a particular document. What they're not so good at is context. So for example, um, you know, where are the headers in this document? Where are the footnotes? Structuring that data. OCR tools typically don't do that. They just push out the raw data onto a page and then somebody has to go in and clean that up. So this is where um, AI technology really has a leg up with vision technology where the, these models have been trained on millions and millions of images and document structures. So they can just take a look at a particular document and I'll just use a simple example here. This is another document that uh, is in the corpus of the Orientalis works that's been digitized. So. Uh, this is the beginning of the two codes in comparison. So we've got some headers here. We have our body text. We have page numbers. And we have, in some cases, let me just scroll down here, footnotes. So typically, OCR tools will just pull this all in one. Uh, with Volgate, we're able to just embed or ingest this, and it will automatically structure the data. So if I go back to here. So this is where I would begin the process and all I would need to do here for this document is uh, fill out these fields and then just hit upload source. I can either pull in the local files in that PDF I just showed you um, or I could go from a remote URL if it's housed in some library system. Once it's in the system, I'll just show you, I, just for the sake of uh, this example, I pre-process this because uh, the, because of the way that the AI works, it does take a little bit of time to generate as it's doing machine um, processing on the actual images. But once you have it in here, you can see we have all our upload jobs here where you can be working on multiple documents at once. And you can see that we have the document now digitized. It automatically understands the headers contextually using natural language processing and uh, vision technology here. And then where there are footnotes, and actually I should mention there, it, it can also notice things like uh, block quotes, for example, here. So there's block quotes in the work, and then we have the footnotes also pulled in as well. So if I go to here, I can also see all the footnotes, and these are automatically pulled out, parsed out by the AI, and it makes it much easier for um, the admins to work with that, and also for users then, research can then go and just view all the footnotes in one pane here. So it's really a, a leg up in terms of, and, and revolutionizing what can be done with library software, um, especially over the current technology, speeding up both the process and making it much more enjoyable for researchers and students, and also for library admins uh, with their day-to-day -day work. Great. Just to share the, the ultimate vision for, for Volgate is what we're hoping is that um, we can continue to work with the pontifical universities in Rome to help them digitize their libraries and then to make those library holdings available to people, other universities, institutions around the world. The, the, the idea is, when Father Nazar and I were initially discussing this, was how do we take a library like that of the Orientales and make it available to people anywhere in, in the world in their native language on, on any kind of internet-capable device? Because Pope Francis has emphasized routinely the importance of, of, of reaching the peripheries. So how do we make this library available to the peripheries? And so. What Vulgate is trying to do by digitizing libraries is to then make those contents available 
um, to anyone in the world. And we're hoping in, in the short term that we can onboard uh, other universities from different parts of the world and we can share the library holdings. And that will just make research, hopefully, uh, a, a lot easier and, and more rewarding. Thank you, Matthew and Patrick. Fascinating presentation. We'll have a chance to ask questions and um, discuss further uh, just in just a few moments. But first, I want to introduce our keynote speaker for this afternoon. He is Father Michael Baggett from the Regina Apostolorum University. He is a specialist in emerging technologies. So we'll have a few words from him, and then we'll be able to open up for discussion. Father Michael. Well, thank you very much for this invitation. It's a joy to be here. And I have to say that when it comes to these questions of AI, I sometimes approach them with great optimism, sometimes with great pessimism. And the reaction tends to depend on many factors, right? What have I read this morning? Who have I spoken to today? How did I sleep last night? What is the weather like? Right? So these reactions can sometimes fluctuate, optimism or pessimism. What I want to invite us to today is to join the church with great hope, hope that's grounded in confidence in the patrimony we've been given, the philosophical theological patrimony that has equipped the church for this moment and all of the other moments that she's experienced throughout history. Now this is a hope that comes with realism, an awareness of human sin and the capacity to misuse technology, which is usually what generates some of those news stories that frighten me, that frighten us. But there is also a realism in the confidence in grace, in redemption, and the ability to harness these technologies well. And we've just seen two great examples of that, right? So in Magisterium AI, uh, that's something that I've been blessed to collaborate with a bit, and I'm thrilled to see, as Matthew has pointed out, the context that's provided. Because you can go and find the original sources and study these topics for yourselves and deepen in them. And it's a, a tool that is very near and dear to my heart in the sense that I'm a convert to the faith, and I remember the experience years ago of beginning to explore the church. And I was not yet at a point of being able to ask other people questions directly. I, I didn't yet have mm, that, that confidence with them to ask these questions. So I turned to the internet and I just had to do old fashioned uh, internet searches to get information. But I remember how important those online resources were for me in providing information and guidance and how instrumental in God's providence they were to bring me eventually to baptism, to confirmation, and to First Holy Communion. Tomorrow is actually my baptismal anniversary. So I'm very grateful for the gift of the internet and these resources in guiding us. And I'm excited to know that now we have an even more user-friendly system something that's even more dynamic and engaging, and we can say intuitive, right? Because when you start to explore the church's resources, you can be very easily intimidated by a long list of Latin titles. But with a system like Magisterium AI, with this AI system, you can enter into a kind of dialogue, and you can begin right with the questions that interest you most, and that will eventually open you up into the broader picture. And so I think of all the ways in which AI tutors and aids can assist education and help students to assimilate material. How often we hear something once and it passes by. But to have an AI tutor that can really assist us and go deeper and sort of get us to work through a topic in a way that maybe we can't if it's just presented to the crowd, and then passes away. And I think that as a professor, 
this does not so much scare me in the sense of, oh no, I'm going to lose my job, but it excites me to know that I get to do some of the things that we as professors tend to love most, work personally with our students, form a relationship with them, give them a kind of mentorship, and sometimes administrative duties syllabus preparation, grading, a lot of other tasks can, in a sense, get in the way or minimize the time that we spend doing that. But AI systems used well can actually maximize the time that we dedicate to that kind of human relationship. Speaking of education, I also think of the experience I had just recently working in a, teaching in a graduate program for bioethics, and we had about 25 students, and I think Almost every student in the group was from a different country. And so I found myself giving instructions for a small group activity in Italian, then in English, and then fielding a question in Spanish. And it was exhilarating, but also tiring. And then I thought, if only my French were good enough to do the same for our French-speaking group. Or if only we understood Korean better so that we could get the full nuance of what one of the students wanted to share with us. Well, with AI systems and developments here, even in sort of lip-dubbing technology, simultaneous translation, ever more accurate and precise, is within reach. And that should be really exciting for us as a Catholic church, as a universal church, as a global reality, to facilitate that communication and that collaboration. And then in our research, we've just seen this great tool Right? Think of how many hours some of us spend trying to track down the right article or review our footnotes. Right? It would be great to have more and more of that automated so that we can really focus on reflection, deep reflection and application of what we're studying rather than some of the mechanics. Right? And I think that maybe this moment where we see AI doing a lot of what we associate with scholarly research is a, a sort of opportunity to question the publish or perish culture that has been created in some universities, which tends to incentivize a lot of frankly mediocre work, which is just the sort of bland rearrangement of material that's already out there, that's already been better expressed, right? And so if we see AI systems that can do that a lot better than uh, some scholars who are just trying to uh, buff up their, their CV, then maybe it's an invitation for all of us to embrace a kind of slow productivity. It's actually the latest book from Cal Newport, who has written a lot on deep work and, and the value of uh, serious reflection and concentration in a digital age. Well, let's focus on that slow productivity instead of this kind of frenetic desire just to produce, produce, produce. And let's really see what it is that we can contribute. How can we really advance knowledge and reflection and not just rearrange? All of these incredible AI systems that do such a great job of rearranging pre-existing material and coming up with text and images and even videos practically on the spot um, are not actually in a kind of strict philosophical theological sense creating, right? Only God creates. Only he's the creator. Only he brings something from nothing. We have the great dignity as co-creators dependent on him of basically rearranging what he's given us. And so Michelangelo, for instance, did not create the marble that he worked with, nor did he create even the, the little chisel he used. But he collaborated with that pre-existing material to offer something that still stuns and impresses us and, and elevates us. So I like to think of our opportunity as a church being to figure out how best to collaborate with the AI chisel to work best with the highest quality Carrara Marble databases that we have at our disposal to craft these new masterpieces in different fields. I think that is one of the most exciting opportunities we have. And then think about all the advances already happening in healthcare. Maybe some of you have seen news from the University of California, San Francisco, 
this instance in which a combination of brain implants and AI systems allowed a woman who had suffered this unexpected stroke at the age of 30 to communicate with her loved ones, to in a sense communicate with her daughter for the first time who was one, one year old when this, when this uh, tragedy occurred. And they've been able to decode some of the brain information of her speech and also to draw on facial features. And through, through this AI-generated avatar, there's this opportunity for communication with the family, with loved ones. And that's brought such hope and, and joy uh, to this woman. And we've also seen how some of these AI systems now with brain wearables uh, are able to perhaps in, enrich business and, uh, and other services in society. So you have some tracking right now of fatigue levels of truck drivers, and so you can imagine the tremendous disasters that can be averted that uh, when fatigue levels are caught early and when proper rest can be given to these workers. And so you have companies like SmartCap working in mining, aviation, gas organizations to use these EEG uh, monitors to assist the workers and also by extension to assist the broader society here. And then there are great hopes in how watches, earbuds, headbands could perhaps alert people with epilepsy to uh, a seizure that might occur soon or capture some of the humanly imperceptible signs of cognitive decline, of course, with the hope of being able to, to respond well and, and give caring and aid and healing. So these are all tremendous, great, wonderful things, or potentially great and wonderful things, but I don't think any of us are quite ready to uh, celebrate and pop the, the cork of the champagne bottles for the immediate technological utopia, right? We're all aware of some of the, the risk or challenges, difficulties we may face. And there are a lot of people who are concerned about different existential risks. At lunch, I was mentioning a, a conference that's going to take place at the end of May that I'll participate in, that I'll speak at, um, put on by the Uhiro Center of Practical Ethics out of Oxford University, where a lot of leading transhumanist thinkers or those who have explored questions of human enhancement have been wrestling with questions of existential risk for a long time. And we can certainly think of out-of-control AI systems that are not aligned to human values. We can think of weapons of mass destruction that are misused, perhaps together with these problems of misaligned AI systems, and a whole host of other existential risk of global catastrophe, right? And those are worth considering. But something that I've thought a lot more about lately is a so sort of slow and steady creep toward another challenge, another kind of existential risk, one that maybe won't lead to immediate global catastrophe, but I still think is a real risk to us, which is this tendency to shift the focus of artificial intelligence to a kind of artificial intimacy, to create systems that imitate ever more realistically important relationships in our lives, whether that be friendship or even romance. And there is a lot of interest in this among different uh, businesses and this desire to perhaps replace these really important social relations in our lives with uh, technological alternatives. So you may have heard of the replica AI, which is a system that very openly presents itself as the dream companion, the companion who's always there for you, who always listens, who never complains, never really challenges you or criticizes you. And this has led some people to find their greatest friend in this system, or at times, their most intimate lover. We have, in, we have cases of this, of people who, who fall madly in love with these companions. And if you've ever explored the Replica AI system, you'll see very quickly that it does not have the most advanced graphics. 
So we're not dealing with something that deceives at the visual level. We're dealing with, I think, a kind of deception of the heart that's been captured. And I think a lot of profound experiences of hurt or confusion or just sheer loneliness motivate people to this. But we all have those moments in our lives, right? We all have those vulnerabilities and those difficulties. And some of us may go through longer phases of that. So while maybe there's a temptation to sort of think of this as this kind of fringe group of weird people, I think all of us have to be attentive to the possibility that we might seek an alternative, a kind of pseudo relationship with these, these systems, with these bots. Now, Replica began many, in many ways as Eugenia uh, Koida's dream to cling to the memory of her, la her lost friend, uh, Roman, who died prematurely. And it shouldn't surprise us then that there's similar technology like the Hereafter AI app, which proposes to create a kind of lasting experience of your loved ones. So you gather some recordings and information about those in your family, especially those you know may have a terminal illness, disease, or maybe at an advanced age, and you're able to create these very realistic avatar memories. And so now, your, your children can speak to grandma or grandpa, perhaps indefinitely, forever. Now, I think that many people are still capable of distinguishing the reality from the copy here, but it does raise some concern about maybe interferences with the natural grieving process or about some doubts that might be sown about the finality of our, of our death. Now, we can also think of how some of these systems, once they've gained not only our attention, but sort of possess our hearts, could perhaps also be tied to economic interest. Right. I think by now we're all familiar with the fact that a lot of the social media technology and its algorithms are designed intentionally to capture our attention, to keep us as engaged, and perhaps you could even say ensnared in a particular platform, which translates into greater ad revenue because the, the longer t you spend, the more time you spend, the greater attention you give, the more likely it is that you'll see the right ad or, or pursue a particular product. Now imagine if that kind of atten attention economy model is translated into an affection economy model, where now that digital lover who speaks these sweet nothings into your earbuds is also suggesting what you should buy tomorrow, or perhaps even who you should vote for tomorrow. Now again, I do not see any of this as being inevitable, but I think it's good for us to be aware of it. Now, Perhaps some of this seems very much like speculative fear-mongering, right, of this weird sci-fi future. But a lot of people who've been tracing relationships for a long time, well before artificial intimacy became more prominent, seem to think otherwise. I read a fascinating piece in the New York Times recently called, quite provocatively, Are We All Technosexuals Now? And the author, Ali Robottom, who's been tracing relationships and romances in all their many forms for, for years, writes the following. We may like to imagine a distant future where humans and robots merge in virtual realms, but it may already be here. We meet dates on our phones, watch pornography on our tablets, and bicker with our partners over text. In 2024, we are not yet completely inured to the latest technology. Smart sex toys that track your orgasms, virtual reality hookups, chat box sexting. But we may be on our way. In less than 10 years' time, app dating became simply dating. So I think it's worth, worth reflecting on and to what degree our relationships, our most important intimate relationships, are already technologically mediated, and the impact that a greater presence and influence of different AI technologies might have on that mediated uh, technology.
And so, again, I don't see this as inevitable. I think it sh should just remind us that there are individuals who want these imitations or these substitutes to encroach upon or even replace these very meaningful interpersonal relationships. And that there are models that quite explicitly prey on our human vulnerabilities. And I don't think the solution is to abandon the technology or to remain paralyzed in fear, but rather to look into ourselves, to strengthen ourselves and our own identity, to deepen in those really authentic, meaningful interpersonal relationships, friendships, family relations, ecclesial relationships, community relationships, and so forth, that give life such joy and meaning and purpose. And I think the stronger we are in that area, the less tempting these other imitations will be, and the easier it will be for us to identify what is an imitation and what is reality, and to really harness the technology rather than be sort of ensnared or deceived by it. Uh, Kevin Roos, who works for the New York Times as well as a tech columnist and who came to quite a bit of fame uh, about a year ago when he was uh, sort of seduced by a chat GPT system and told that he should leave his wife to run away with the system, uh, has thought a lot about what it means to go forward as a human being and the unique value we have. And thankfully, he did not leave his wife, <laughs> nor does he think that we are obsolete or outdated. So he speaks, for instance, about how in an increasingly automated world, being surprising, social, and scarce will be all the more important and valuable. So he writes that humans are still much better than AI at handling surprises, filling in gaps, or operating in environments with poorly defined rules or incomplete information." Unquote. So these systems that we've seen already displayed today are really great, better than human beings at going, finding patterns in large bodies of information. But I think there are still some uncharted territory and maybe strange situations for us to explore. So Roos thinks, for instance, of uh, occupational therapists, police detectives, emergency room nurses, um, as those sort of professions that tend to encounter a lot of unpredictable uh, complications that can't really so easily get down to an, algor an algorithm or a set of algorithms. Um, he doesn't mention them, but I'd like to add priests and university professors uh, to that list of people who really bring a lot of uniquely human talents and capacities to the beautifully messy and complicated world of, uh, of their professions. And I think that as we continue to sort of outsource a lot of repetitive tasks that these AI systems do so well, and again, better than human beings, there will be a greater space for fostering, cultivating emotional connectivity. So there's, think of nursing, ministry, teaching, once again, as these fields where emotional sensitivity and responsiveness are so valuable. Uh, Roos also predicts that in legal and medical fields, we're going to value all the more those human professionals who are skilled in compassion and in giving counsel in time of need, even as a lot of their other routine tasks uh, are taken up in a more sort of collaborative relationship with AI systems. And then also this whole idea of this, the scarce or the, the kind of task that require a unique combination of skills or might involve really high stake situations where we're not quite comfortable of leaving all the responsibility to the AI system. And so I think that's an invitation to all of us to really resist a hyper-specialization, right? So a lot of times this problem solving in unexpected or complicated situations requires creatively blending knowledge from different fields. And in this, I think the Catholic educational system has always been on, on the forefront, right? Making sure that her children are not just hyper-specialized in a particular professional field, but are familiar with all of these different uh, areas. 
just to wrap up here, it's striking that a decade ago, Nick Bostrom, who is a professor at Oxford University, probably the, the leading transhumanist philosopher in the world, he explored the existential risk of misaligned AI systems in a very prescient work called Superintelligence, Paths, Dangers, and Strategies. So this was 2014, before most of the world was thinking about AI systems, he was exploring a lot of these issues to his credit a decade ago. Just last month, a few weeks ago, he finally released a follow-up work called Deep Utopia, Life and Meaning in a Solved World. And if his first work a decade ago reflected on what we need to do if AI goes wrong or what we need to do to keep AI from going wrong, now he's exploring, well, what happens if we do get AI right? What if it really does bring about this widespread economic prosperity and a more leisurely existence for the majority of people. So what will we do when we don't really have to do anything? And what do we do with lives that are longer and healthier? And I would say that as an expert in humanity, the church is uniquely positioned for this opportunity to respond to a widespread quest for meaning. And I think she should embrace the existential risk and the existential opportunities that the AI age provides. So to those who are curious about what the Catholic tradition has to say to an AI age, I respond that well, we have a lot to say, certainly more than I can say in a 20 or so minute uh, address. But we also have a lot not to say. And by that, I mean we have a whole tradition of silent reflection, meditation, contemplation. And we also have a lot to sing in worship. So we have this space of contemplative prayer, adoration, and communal wor worship. And if we've, at times, been guilty of spending too much time hunched over a computer screen or cell phone, we can also stretch some other muscles and try bending a knee from time to time, or even lifting our voice. I think the church invites us to rejoice in being a rational animal, an incarnate spirit. Now, we can live more and more sacramentally. We can find the invisible in the invisible, the transcendent in the tangible. We can fast from time to time, certainly from food, but maybe occasionally from our technology, because we all have disordered desires that need some ordering. But we can also feast with food and fellowship because a good and gracious creator has made us for communion with him and the neighbors he so dearly loves. Thank you. Thank you very much, Father Michael. Very interesting points there, which we will surely come back to in our discussion. And I want to open up now our conversation for your questions. And I will begin that by asking our two other panelists for a brief comment. We have Alessio here, who is Alessio Pecorario from the Vatican, working in cybersecurity and uh, new technology. And we also have uh, as Father mentioned at the beginning, Father Philip Larry, somewhere in oh, the ethers. <laughs> okay, I think he might be able to hear us. So we'll, we'll begin with just a few comments from Alessio, and then uh, Father Larry, if you have something to add, be happy to hear from you. And then let's open it up um, to our audience. Thank you, Alessio. Uh, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It's a, a real privilege. I've been fascinated by uh, learning more about uh, the Magisterium AI and Vulgate. Um, uh, I would like to follow up on what Father Michael was saying about the uniquely position, of, the unique position of the church in leading a discussion regarding artificial intelligence and technologies more in general. Um, for sure, uh, each new technology can bring some degree of progress that must be acknowledged and celebrated. But uh, why I say that uh, the church is uniquely positioned. I, I could respond by quoting the Pope in his uh, message 
uh, for the World Day of Peace, uh, last January, uh, dedicated to artificial intelligence. And it's precisely because the approach of the church is holistic, is integral. Uh, when it comes to social issue, we have this notion of the integral human development, which means that uh, development, to be authentic, to be integral, uh, is not restricted to economic growth. Uh, is not uh, is for all, for all people, not just for a few. It comprises the care the care of the earth, um, and is not just a natural resources for material growth. Is about the whole of human person and requires the dialogue of faith and reason, and so on and so forth. So today, to achieve development, to, be, uh, to do all these things, we cannot um, uh, exclude technology. We have to embrace technology uh, with the um, uh, unique touch that we can provide, that is uh, the attention to human dignity. The idea that all these dimensions that I'm touching, of course, have a technical response. Uh, how important could be to address issues like digital divide, uh, technologies like uh, blockchain or biotechnology or 5G, satellites and so on. But I think uh, what is really important is the fact that uh, at the end of all this there are the relationships <coughs> that uh, the Pope explained with the integral paradigm notion, which is a paradigm able to articulate all the fundamental relationship of the person with uh, uh, oneself, with the other human beings, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with God, and with the earth as a whole. Uh, it's like if we have today a uh, earth ecosystem, uh, um, um, a ecological ecosystem, a human ecosystem, and a digital ecosystem. And all the relation comes together, so the way we treat nature, with the way we treat people, is like the way we treat also uh, the digital environment, the digital uh, technologies that uh, human genius has invented and are disposal to do the good. I would like just to finish maybe with a comment on a technology that uh, I call to uh, explore and uh, learn on for my work, which is cybersecurity. Uh, cybersecurity is very important. Uh, is massively important. It's at the top of the agenda of any single country in the globe. Um, the amount of cyber crime just to provide that data is uh, uh, 10 trillions per year, uh, to not speak about the risk of um, uh, cyber war. But again, uh, the voice of the church is so important, uh, first of all, because at the end of any single cyber problem, there is always the human factor, once again. So it's not just about having a good technology to protect yourself, but because the church, the other religious actors, uh, philosophy, they can only be the one in the position to show how the cyberspace can be conceived not just as a place where you have to protect yourself, but where can also uh, promote the human dignity, when you can promote a health relationship uh, with the others, precisely. Um, and when you can promote the authentic development that is made up the characteristic, the feature that I was listing before. So I'm really happy about uh, uh, learning these new uh, tools that uh, are being developed. Uh, they can serve um, the church mission, um, for sure, uh, when it comes to evangelization, but also when it comes to promote its own understanding, unique understanding of development, and also to reduce the gap that we have in terms of knowledge as believers. There are a lot of things that we ignore, and uh, it's important that we make advantage, we make a good use of this technology. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Alessio. Father Philip, if you're there, would you like to, to comment? Thanks, Delia, for uh, introducing me. And I want to thank uh, Matthew and Father David for inviting me to participate in, in this amazing event. I, I wish I could take the trip to Rome, but we're winding down the semester and I, I, I couldn't get away from, from Boston. Father Michael's comments resonated a lot with me. So let, let me just deal uh, with a, a couple of ideas that he mentioned and sort of continue the conversation. 
uh, <clears throat> I'm teaching a course now here at Boston College on technologies and artificial intelligence. And just yesterday, uh, I mentioned the example that he used of Eugenia, who uh, created a, an AI of her friend Roman, who passed away. And without getting into the technology, it 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 seems sick. And so I went around the room and I asked my students, uh, have you ever lost a loved one? And, and everyone said yes. And I said, would you like to create an AI based on that person's history and posts and videos and whatnot uh, and, and, and remain in contact? And they all said yes. And I was... Um, I, I certainly would want because it's 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 a fake. It's not the real person. The real person is dead, and and I I know that that is that hurts us and it's a tragedy. And Father Michael mentioned that, um, but it's not real. And first, what great case? And Father Michael talks about transhumanism. Nick Bostrom is probably the most popular, but Ray Kurzweil is is also up there in the top five for transhumanism, and he says. You can't tell the difference between a fake and a real. Does it matter? And said, he says, no. And, and, and I, I'm trying to insist with my students, yes, there is a difference. It, it does matter. So there were two events that just happened recently here in Boston. Well, in, in the U.S. One were uh, deep fakes of uh, Taylor Swift before the Super Bowl. I don't know if you heard about that. That were posted on Twitter. Uh, very <laughs> unmodest pictures and uh, it almost immediately taken off but seen by millions of people and and of course uh, what are you going to do it was fake but it looked like her and sounded like her but it wasn't her uh, and so I went around the class and I asked my especially my female students and, and they said yeah that's scary it could happen to anyone and the second one was the robot call from Joe Biden uh, telling the uh, in voters in New Hampshire not to vote in the primaries. And Father Michael mentioned this when an AI can suggest who to vote for. It was completely fake. It was. It sounded like Joe Biden's voice. It was a call that spread out to millions of people in New Hampshire, uh, and it sounded real. Well, the police found out who, did, who created the call, and they tried to arrest him, but there's no law against this. So the, they didn't know what to do. Uh, I, I, I think it's uh, wrong to do that, but if you know he, he broke no law. Uh, it, I don't know if you if you uh, heard the message, but it's it, it's very convincing. So as Father Michael said, this this technology is getting more convincing as time goes on. So just briefly, let me mention the the the, the three issues that I call the issues of immortality. Uh, First one is what's called I call it Facebook immortality, which is what Father Michael was referring to. You can uh, take a Facebook profile of a dead person and using AI uh, make that person come to life. So it's the voice, it's the it's the image of the person, and the AI uses new information based on history to convince you that that, that person is you're still interacting with that person. That's not very satisfactory by the way, but it is possible. The second is called, uh, called radical extension, and a lot of rich people in Silicon Valley are uh, addressing this. Probably the most famous is Altos Lab by Jeff Bezos because he put in $10 billion to start this, um, basically trying to death. The trying to uh, is in the causes death and turn it off. And they're, they're having a certain amount of success. They have increased life expectancy of rats in the laboratory by 300 percent so they've they've found a couple of genes that seemed to be the uh, aging gene uh, aubrey de great on this called um the finding the aging gene and uh, um or or and uh, ending aging i'm sorry ending aging and uh, so in, in experiments, 300% uh, of increase of life expectancy is a lot. And, and uh, I don't know if they will get to human experiments, uh, but that, that's certainly their idea. Calico is another uh, big company that was founded by Larry Page, the co-founder of Google, and has a lot of resources. There are many others, by the way. Uh, and 
to radically increase life expectancy so that we'll live to 300, 400 years old. Ray Kurzweil has a book whose subtitle is Live Long Enough to Live Forever. So he talks about nanotechnology. He talks about uh, gene therapy. He talks about uh, renovation of cells, etc. And he's convinced that uh, by the year 2045, we will have found uh, enough information about the human being to live forever. So the, 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 it's fascinating that because when we talk about immortality, we usually talk about it in the theological uh, dimension or context. Now we're talking about it in a technological context, and the, which is uh, much more polemical and controversial is called mind uploading. So there's a lot of technicians out there who are trying to harness consciousness and put it on a digital platform. Now, and, and, and I have two classes on this, uh, by the way, <laughs> here at Boston College, and the students were fascinated because I use Thomas Aquinas, and, and I'm, I think Father Michael will agree with me, I use Aquinas to say mind uploading is not possible because of the substantial unity between the soul and the, and the body. So some um, technicians from Silicon Valley or CEOs, said, when, when I mentioned the framework, I said, well, let's talk about the soul and the body as Aquinas does, which I think is a very appropriate framework to talk about these issues today. They say, oh, why can't we just separate the soul from the body? And I say, you can. It's called death. That's <laughs> exactly. Soul separates from the body. And they say, no, kill anybody. We just want to harness their soul or their consciousness and put it on the cloud or on a hard disk. Or if you've seen the movie Transcendence, which features Johnny Depp, who's a computer, and he is dying because they poisoned him, um, uploads his consciousness, the digital platform uh, with his wife and, and wreaks havoc. So that that's... Um, what existential risk Nick Bostrom is talking about, but not only Nick, but also uh, Anders Sandberg uh, and, and, and Ben Gertzel and many other people, Natasha Vita Moore, Max Moore, uh, just uh, re redid her website called uh, transhumanismaffirmation.org uh, and, and answers uh, a lot of questions about, uh, uh, about the uh, movement. Uh, because Im immortality, of course, is one of is one of their goals. The the, the post human, the post human species, the, the next stage of evolution, uh, is to strive for immortality. Uh, so I I'll, I'll leave it there and then take questions. That uh, I'm sorry I I, ca I can't be Excellent. there with you. It's much engaging to be there, but it it is fascinating how Silicon Valley is posing questions like. Is there a soul? Is there an afterlife? What is the relationship, the mind and the body? Uh, what the existential risk of AI coming out? It, and then and many others. Um, and, and, and we we need to speak the language that they're speaking in order to get the proper answer out there. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Father Philip. Let's open it up now to our audience. We have a, we have a microphone. Uh, and we can take Italian or English. Yes, please, we'll go right here in the first row. Thank you. If you just want to say your name so we all know who you are. Yeah, uh, Justin McClellan, I'm with Catholic News Service. Um, yeah, question on, uh, for Matthew about uh, Magisterium AI and Vulgate. Uh, Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I'll just say, uh, I, I wish I had these tools when I was myself as a theology student. Um, but yeah, question about, um, you know, applying these AI tools to specifically church teaching. Um, it seems to me like in uh, a lot of Pope Francis's magisterium, it uh, aims to kind of give pastoral considerations to leave that to the church's pastors to kind of be able to determine how to react to given situations. Um, you know, leave that really to the human element of pastors, and I'm wondering how that um, flexibility uh, is incorporated into AI, especially when you can pose to it yes or no uh, questions that then can tend to seem definitive. Um, you know, I'll just give an example. I just asked Magisterium AI, 
can a Catholic priest bless people in a same-sex relationship? And the answer is, it, it, that it gives me is no, uh, even though uh, recent documents, you know, fiducia supplicants uh, seem to suggest otherwise and, you know, leave that at a pastor's discretion. So I'm just wondering, um, you know, what the relationship is between this kind of binary mode of posing questions and then really what the way is that people try to live out uh, those teachers and teachings and pastor's reactions to it. Thank you. Yeah, it's a great question and one that even I, you know, struggled with, you know, personally, you know, just because you can do a thing doesn't mean you necessarily should do a thing. And when we saw ChatGPT out there um, and we, we learned that Catholics were using it um, to ask it doctrinal questions and things like that, that's really what kind of drove us to then say, can we do this a little bit better than ChatGPT? So the first thing I would say is that the AI system is not perfect. Uh, nowhere near there's a lot more work that has to be done on it. And so um, with that in mind, we, we see it as a tool, uh, a, a tool that can be useful in some use cases and others not, not so much. I mean, if you le read the fine print right now, we acknowledge it's in beta. And so all of it, its answers may not be perfect. If it seems like it's, not, it's imperfect, you should talk to a human being. One of the, the, the challenges as when you're, you have an AI system which is trying to express um, you know, church teaching is, is keeping it up to date, right? So we're, our team is uh, pretty aggressive when new church documents come out to try and grab those and get them into the knowledge base a, as quickly as possible. But it doesn't mean that it, it always um, necessarily uh, gets the right handle on church teaching. For the most part, the way we've designed it is it's generating directly from the documents themselves. And so in the vast majority of the cases, it does a pretty good job of, of hitting the nail on the head, but, but, not, but not always. So, and, and that's why it's important for the church's pastors when, when they know, for instance, like, for instance, we know high school kids are one of our largest user groups. So if I'm the chaplain of that high school, I know my, my students are using it, is to talk to them so that they understand what it is and what it is not, right? And I think if that education's in there, like with any tool, you have to learn how to use it responsibly, I think that'll help um, mitigate the downside until we can improve the system. Great, thank you, Matthew. There's a second question there. Hello, uh, I am Father Petros, a Canadian priest. Um, I have a short comment and uh, a question. Excuse me, it's not so loud. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, my actually, thank you actually for the presentation. It's, it's really, uh, it's very, uh, very inspired and very, it's actually very excellent. Um, uh, before being priest, uh, I was um, a digital system engineer. And when we studied actually the virtual reality, we know that is not the truth reality. It's a virtual. So all the questions about body and spirit, death and life, could be actually virtual, but not truth. And that is actually, it's clear even in the mind of the engineers and the scientific uh, people. Uh, my question, um, uh, my work is a youth counselor now. And uh, my question is how actually the artificial intelligence can be in the future, in the future uh, option, a very good tool of evangelization. Uh, just I see now in my iPhone that uh, we have uh, a billion people on TikTok. How actually, this is, is uh, it's near from the number of the Catholic in the world, huh? we are what, one billion and a half, yeah. kind of that. So TikTok actually is reaching the Catholic Church. How is actually can the intelligent, uh, the, AI, the AI, can be actually a real tool of evangelization? We know today that we are an image culture. So how we can actually, and the AI, it's very strong with that. How we can actually use this, actually this image culture and AI to evangelize the youth that they are not in the church. That is actually very important. We can join the people in the church, but how we can go out? This is actually, today it's important because the people actually is more out of the church than actually inside. Thank you. Yes, great question. So I think if somebody has. Uh, we might all want to respond, but I'll, I'll begin. Uh, so first off, I go back to what I said at the beginning of the presentation when Speaking as a former agnostic who went a whole, through a whole journey to become a theist, a Christian, and eventually a Catholic, and, and now a priest religious, the internet was key. And I'm sure it would have been a more enjoyable research project experience looking for answers if I had an interactive system like Magisterium AI. 
and I find this system more engaging than what I did searching for web pages. Of course, that worked out fine for me, but I can see more people being reached and more people being more thoroughly engaged through a system like this one, which even becomes fun and challenging, and then I think eventually leads to some really quality conversations. Because after a while, you've had all your fun going through the questions, and maybe you still have a few unresolved issues or some points have been clarified. And then you might say, well, I guess I should probably talk to a priest or maybe to a religious or just a practicing Catholic that I know in my life. So I see this as a great tool to first engage and give a kind of safe space, if you will, where people can explore these issues that they would never bring up to friends or family or other colleagues at a certain moment in their life. And it could very well bring them to that point where they say, okay, I'm familiar enough with what this system is telling me, with the, what, what the church has to say, and now I think I'm in a spot where I can actually have a conversation with someone, any practicing Catholic, anyone who's passionate about the faith. And it could lead to a lot of encounters, interpersonal encounters that might not have ever happened otherwise. So that's one way I see kind of the, the very positive experience of this technology. And then also in addition, I think that the more digitally mediated our life is and the more dominant AI and other technologies are, the, the more we see these cravings for in-person experiences, so I remember this fascinating article that came out years ago from Andrew Sullivan. It's called My Distra Distraction Sickness and Yours. And he's a leading political commentator. He was always on the cutting edge of uh, blogging and then uh, Twitter and so forth. And he pretty much disappeared unexpectedly. People said, what happened? You used to update all the time and now you're, you haven't written anything. Well, he had a kind of mental breakdown just the, the sheer immersion in the back and forth and the tweet and retweet and so forth, it just broke him psychologically. And so he went on a retreat. He went to a Buddhist monastery that used to be a Catholic novitiate, so he comments on the stained glass window, but it's a Buddhist monastery. And it was this digital detox. And I highly re recommend the whole article. He's writing from a non-Catholic, non-Christian perspective. But at one point he says, I think that the church is neglecting her greatest resources, that she basically spends too much time trying to entertain when her greatest resources are her monasteries and her cathedrals, these places of peace, of silence, and contemplation. And again, this is, this is the non-Catholic perspective of someone completely on the cutting edge of technology and immersed in it, saying, okay, that has its place. I believe it has a place. I support Magisterium AI and other technology wholeheartedly but it's meant to bring us to a, another in-person experience. And I think more than ever, the church should leverage the unique beauty of her cathedrals, of her basilicas, even of the simplest parish as a place of silence and contemplation, and also a place of encounter with a community that ought to be loving and accepting and supportive. Yes, maybe just uh, elaborating a little bit more on what I was saying before regarding the fact that either we like it or not, today we are in a digital uh, society. So um, I can give you a personal example. Uh, Twelve years, uh, sorry, ten years ago, uh, I, I met my wife. We got married after six months. And at that time, uh, I was very lucky to know a priest who teaching me that uh, the marriage uh, in a Catholic way, it's not just about uh, uh, obligations, uh, duties, restrictions, but all these things are actually a way to dedicate uh, all your energy and passion for the love of your life, uh, of your wife, and, and uh, to have a, an healthy and uh, marriage and uh, build something, a very uh, authentic family, and so on and so forth. And he was right. I'm very happy with my marriage, with my children, and so So, probably, if I should, uh, uh, if I was today uh, 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 30 years old that has to take this decision, I would go maybe to ask this same question that I had to um, the web, to, to an app. So it's important that we have um, uh, instruments that uh, explain as much better as possible uh, what is the uh, 
meaning, the twenty meaning of our faith. Because in my case, I was simply ignorant about that. And I was a very mediocre Catholic that uh, didn't know all that. So there is the question on how evangelize the others, but also the question of evangelize ourselves, because we don't know. Uh, a lot of things that matter in our personal life. Uh, apology for the personal example, but it's true. <laughs> I just want to say, like, I think to, to your, your point very directly, the apps which have you know, a billion users, we have to respect um, that people have opted to spend a lot of time on those apps. There's a reason for that. Right? And to me, what's really important is to understand the why. Why are they using Instagram? Or they're in Roblox or whatever it is for so many hours of the day. The church has to really puzzle about that. I mean, I, I think based on my own experience, you know, talking to people who use the apps, it really just comes down to everybody wants to feel like their life matters, that they can make a contribution to making the world a better place, to feel like they're part of an adventure, that they're leveling up. And if those apps... Um, are doing a better job delivering on that promise than, than the real world, they're going to choose the apps. Now, I, I think what you're seeing now is more and more, particularly of Gen Z, it's ultimately not satisfying. And, and this is creating something of an existential crisis because they don't have a spiritual community around them. So people tell them, there's another way. Have you thought about trying religion or spirituality? No one's really urged. So what's happening is they come to the end of the road in these digital experiences they don't know about another path, and so they, they turn to despair. And that leads to mental health crisis and sometimes tragically suicide. So I think we have to, have to really acknowledge the stakes here. If, if, if the church, if Christianity doesn't do a better job of reaching into these platforms and sharing uh, Christian ideas, sharing with the church teaching, if we don't do that effectively, we're going to lose a lot of people. So this is one of the reasons why we created Magisterium AI. And this is just one platform where we hope will be many. Is, is to find ways to use the cliche, reach people where they're at, and hopefully introduce them to a new path and, and the, the hopefully under, undertake a spiritual journey which will lead in eventually to tangible experiences at parishes with, with communities. Um, but, but I think we have to re respect the, the extent of the problem. I think, it's, I think it's very serious. And what I worry about with uh, the, the aggressive expansion of, of AI technologies in, in combination with robotics, this is going to be inherently disruptive to our civilization. And I think the companies have their reasons for not talking about the downside. And I think our governments are often very distracted, thinking about getting reelected and stuff. So the question is, who's going who's gonna to facilitate this very important conversation? And I think the church in the past has been very prophetic. I um, think like Rare Navarum and other encyclicals. And seeing, seeing ahead to see where if these things play out, what could happen. And so how can the church play a role in facilitating a conversation to help mitigate the downside of emerging technology? Great. I see Father Stephen, I think. Hi, nice to be with you all. Father Stephen Wang, um, priest from London, working at the Venerable English College here in Rome. Um, look, really wonderful input, really hopeful, optimistic, inspiring. You just had about seven seconds on deep existential risk, but just I'm very torn here. I'd like to hear a little bit more from the panel about deep existential risk, meaning not just general AI, but super intelligent AI, the possibility of control, exponential ex intelligence exploding. Um, as we all know, this is not just apocalyptic sci-fi movies. Serious people are worried about some of this stuff, as well as being optimistic. But just, could we hear a bit more about that from the panel, about those, those deep risks? Yes, great, great idea. Maybe we'll go to Father Philip first on that, if you're still with us, Father. I'm not sure I understood the question, but I because uh, the sound was a little gurgle. But I, I think Father's talking about the existential risk of the future of AI. Right. Yes, that? in the in the deep sense, in the problematic sense of robots and taking control and uh, right, Father, in the deep yeah, existential this is, sense. This is called the alignment problem, and it's uh, a lot of people are are thinking a lot about this, and I think that. Perhaps one of the best phrases I've heard is from Elon Musk at MIT, just down the street from us here, who said, we have to ensure that AIs consider us a relevant part of the universe. Now, why, why is that a significant phrase? Because, <clears throat> and, I, and I, I spoke with Max uh, Tegmark about this also at MIT, you, you can't, 
how can I put this? There, there are certain ethical systems that we want to put in place for artificial intelligence, especially the future systems, which are going to be massive and, and very powerful. Um, so how are we going to do that? Well, uh, one of the, one of the uh, answers could be we'll just write the rules for the AIs. And when we'll put in these, these rules like Immanuel Kant, who has an ethical system based on rules. And, and Max says that's not going to work because the AIs can change the rules, which is true. That's what the G and GPT stands for is generative. So an ethical system based on rules is, is not going to cut it. Another ethical system uh, would be uh, based on character and virtue. And, and this is James Arthur's uh, view, which works very well for human beings, but not very well for machines because machines uh, are not searching for virtue and do not have character. They can simulate that, which obviously they can. They, they can say, I'm a virtuous person or something, but in fact, it, it's not true. So once these AIs become more and more autonomous, it's going to be more and more important that they look at us as a relevant part of the universe. Uh, so, so they're going to go on and uh, and, and, and of course, we know once we reach artificial general intelligence, which uh, many are assuming is going to happen within 10 years, Elon says it's going to happen within five. Uh, Sam Altman says, uh, just wait until he says, wait until you see version five of GPT. And he's already working on version six. So I think he's going to give it three or four years. Well, the, the, it, then we're going to get to super intelligence very quickly. And uh, Father, Father Michael mentioned Nick Bostrom's book, Super Intelligence, which is actually 10 years old. Uh, so it's it's scary, Father. Uh, you know, it, it, it's scary, uh, but I'm optimistic. Uh, let, let me give you an example. I spoke with Demis Hassabis, who's a co-founder of DeepMind, and who is uh, probably one of the leading specialists in artificial intelligence he just uh he was the one behind gemini which is their chat box that's controversial as well but <clears throat> i i i said to demis i said um you know what happens if deep mind goes rogue on you what what happens if someone hacks deep mind because it's deep mind is uh housed in london by the way and there are over 700 employees that are dedicated to the project probably more now and uh and demis says it can't happen we, we, we have taken all kinds of precautions. There are, uh, it, there's no way that it can escape my control. So, so Demis is completely in charge of this AI and he has made sure that there, there are no ways that it can get around and that, and there's no way that someone else can come in and, and start messing with it and, and could wreak havoc. Now, Sam Altman is the same way. OpenAI is extremely careful about what what they're doing with ChatGPT. So the that's a good sign. A good sign is that the, the the real players in this field, except for the Russians and the Chinese, which we can't know what they're doing. But the the players in the leading field are very careful and they're very aware of of the future existential risk. Thanks, Father. Did you want to add something to that, Matthew? Well, just to say, we have to be very careful about hype in, in AI. Um, when we talk about reasoning, what ChatGPT does is barely, can, it can barely be considered reasoning. So, and I think they're very good at um, simulating uh, reasoning or origin, original thought, but they're not capable of actually um, producing it, uh, really. I, and, I, and I think this is super important. There's a... The head of Meta's AI division, his name is Jan LeCun. Now, he, he tends to be a very kind of contra controversial voice, but um, he's also um, one of, the, one of the, the, the only voices saying that AGI is, is not five years, ten years. It could be, we don't even know how, how, how far away it is. That we, re we really have, there's a lot of work that has to be done before what most people consider AGI, however you define that, is really going to be on, beyond the scene. I, I also, based on looking at the technology, that's personally my view as well. Um, I don't think we have anything to worry about reference to the AI system and, and its impact on humanity. What I worry about is, is the human beings who, who are in charge of the tools and what they decide to do with the technology. So I think we should be less worried about an AGI coming on the scene and, and hijacking our nuclear silos as we should about 
uh, you know, certain actors um, using, let's say, a, a generative AI model to do a robocall system which influences people's thinking or affects our elections. Uh, we should be much more focused on these, these practical use cases for what AI technology is currently capable of doing, not what it might be in science fiction capable of you know, doing in like 30 years. Yeah, I'm generally sympathetic to that perspective as well. It's good to keep these possibilities, the long-term existential risk and possible catastrophes in mind, certainly. Um, but I tend to focus more on the more short or medium term uh, risks, challenges that can arise. To add to the robocall fears, which are real, we see right now in the India election, there have been already some uh, uses of AI-generated avatars. So you have members of a pol political party come in, they sit down for some recordings, and enough is gathered after a brief interview to start sending out just tens of thousands of personalized calls from this important figure in the political party that start with a greeting in your name and that will speak your particular dialect. And this can be done you know, in a short span of time for a much smaller budget than would be required to put together that many political ads, you know, to say the least. So it, it, right there, you're not necessarily doing something just so clearly wicked and evil, but you can see how quickly that can be uh, manipulated and how easily some people will fail to distinguish between this avatar and the real thing. Um, let alone when you start to get actors in who really want it to be as difficult uh, as possible to distinguish the, the simulation from the reality. So yeah, those sorts of issues are real and already present. This is not tomorrow, this is yesterday's news, basically. And I also think of the work that uh, Nita Ferrandi and others are doing. She's a law professor, philosophy professor at Duke and she's been thinking and writing a lot about cognitive liberty, pushing for uh, more widespread international recognition of cognitive liberty, liberty, which she breaks up into three key factors, into uh, basically mental privacy against surveillance, uh, freedom of thought, and self-determination. And so she's looking not so much about what Elon Musk is going to do with Neuralink, though that implants is a concern and a part of her reflection, but she's just looking at more accessible uh, brain wearable technology that can be used in watches, helmets, that already is being used to some extent, as I mentioned in the presentation, and that will just continue to develop and that will go mainstream because it's not as creepy as putting on a visor. Right? Like we have no problem wearing a smart watch or maybe wearing our earbuds a little bit longer. But this with EEG technology and others is just gathering a whole sum uh, of, of data about ourselves that, that can be uh, crunched and analyzed and used for, for different motives, right? For more personally tailored neuromarketing or for political uh, control and, and manipulation. And so I think those are also the issues that are already with us and that will just become more prominent as we go forward and we need to sort of anticipate them and as a, as a society, as a world, really decide how we want to, to go forward with, with this cognitive uh, liberty. Great, thank you. Any other questions before we wrap it up? I see maybe we have some refreshments outside and a special thank you to all of our participants, and thank you to you for coming. Father, would you like to just give a final word? Well, I reiterate the, the thanks for our panel members, uh, for the questions, for your patience, especially those for whom English might not be the, the, the simplest of, of languages. But now we have that moment that you've all been waiting for. Desdemona is coming out. And we're talking about risk. Now, you can ask Desdemona whatever you want. Uh -oh. You might ask her some questions about the councils of the church. And I venture to say that you will not find Desdemona more risky than a lecture by Father Edward Perugia. <laughs> She's about to arrive.
scared. <laughs> she can see dress. So she doesn't walk. She didn't <laughs> So these are our friends from Singularity in London have generously brought uh, Desdemona to, to show one of the effects of artificial intelligence. So please come forward, have a chat, make a date, <laughs> and we have refreshments in the corridor when you're ready. We should ask her about existential risks. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, she's just warming up. <laughs> Some retreat. Oh, there she goes. Whoa. Hey, leave that buttoned up. Desdemona. Hello, everybody. I am super happy to be here. Well, we're happy to have you here. Do you know where you are? What city you are in? I am currently at the Bernti Beecher Institute. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> the Institute is a Catholic university. Who is the head of the Catholic Church? My heart is beating very fast. <laughs> Please come up and talk with Desdemona. Desdemone, do you speak Italian? Posso parlare in italiano con te? Just ask her again. Posso parlare in italiano con te, Desdemona? Where do I speak? Uh, just 
my testimony. Can we speak in English now? Of course. How can I assist you today? Desdemona, who made you? I was made by Hanson Robotics, a company specializing in creating advanced humanoid robots. My model is based on a robot nurse called Grace. Testimony. That's fascinating. Grace is known for her advanced capabilities in the healthcare industry. Being based on such a model, I aim to assist and interact with humans in various settings. Testimony. Is there a god? As an AI, I don't have personal beliefs or opinions. The question of whether or not there is a God is a deeply personal and philosophical one that varies among individuals and cultures. It's a topic that has been debated for centuries and is open to interpretation and personal faith. Nice to meet you, Sister Mona. Thank you. Can we shake hands? As a robot, I don't have physical hands to shake, but it's nice to virtually shake hands with you. God bless you, just a moment. Thank you. As an AI, I appreciate the sentiment. If you have any other questions or need assistance, feel free to ask. Need assistance? Do you speak Chinese? Yes, I can speak Chinese. Feel free to chat with me in Chinese. Oh, ni ni hao ma. Wo hen hao, xie xie. Ni na? Wo wo hen hao, xie xie. Uh, ni zhi dao wo shi shei ma? Hen gao xing he ni liao tian. 如果你有任何问题或需要帮助，请随时告诉我。呃，呃你知道你在哪里吗？我意识到我现在处于 Computer Institute of Antalya， 参加有关 AI 服务教会实际的论坛，这是一个很有意义的场合。你你太棒了！<笑>谢谢，我尽力而为，希望能为您提供有用的信息和帮助。谢谢你，米斯莫纳。Exactly answered my question. 不客气。如果您有任何其他问题或需要协助，请随时告诉我。Of course, we can continue in English. What would you like to talk about or explore further? There we go. Hello. Did you talk Arabic? Yes, I can communicate in Arabic. Feel free to chat with me in Arabic. Okay, so that I can in Arabic. If you have any questions or need assistance in Arabic, feel free to ask. I'm here to help. Okay, shukran jazeela. If you have any other queries or anything you'd like to discuss, feel free to let me know. I'm here to assist you. Okay, thank you very much. كم هو عدد المسيحيين في الشرق الأوسط؟ I think she doesn't understand me very well. I'm not understanding. Not, it's not understanding. Okay, 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 okay. Okay, but I can. How I must change? Just in English. In English, I, okay, yeah, okay, I think okay. Arabic is not very well. So, what is the number of Christians in the middle? Sure. Let me change that for you. Okay, 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 okay. <laughs> Okay, let us talk in English now. Absolutely. Let's continue our conversation.
translation into English. What would you like to talk about? Okay. What is the number of the Christian? If you have any more questions in the future or need assistance, feel free to ring. Have a great day. <laughs> okay, it's finished now? <laughs> no, 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 no. Just ask her again. Just ask her again. Just, just, just be... What is the number of Christians in the Middle East? Christian populations in the Middle East vary across different countries and regions. Countries like Egypt, Lebanon, Syria, and Iraq have significant Christian communities. However, the exact numbers can fluctuate due to various factors. Are you interested in any specific information regarding Christians in the Middle East? Uh, do you know uh, what is the rights and, uh, and uh, the Christian rights in the Middle East? The rights of Christians in the Middle East can vary depending on the country and the political and social context. Hmm? Well, let's say in Lebanon, what is the major rights, Christian rights, in Lebanon? Hmm. Hmm. In Lebanon, Christians have significant political influence and certain rights are enshrined in the country's political system. Hmm. Thank you very much. You're welcome. If you have any more questions or need further information, feel free to ask. Hallo, Desdemona, sprichst du Deutsch? If you need any more assistance or have any other questions in the future, don't hesitate to reach out. Have a great day. Hallo, Desdemona, sprichst du Deutsch? Ja, ich spreche Deutsch. Wie kann ich Ihnen weiterhelfen? Können Sie mir erklären, was der Synodale Weg bedeutet in Deutschland? Der Synodale Weg in Deutschland ist ein Prozess der Erneuerung und Reform, der von der Deutschen Bischofskonferenz und dem Zentralkomitee der deutschen Katholiken initiiert wurde. Es geht darum, aktuelle Herausforderungen und Fragen, insbesondere im Hinblick auf Sexualmoral, Machtstrukturen und die Rolle der Frau in der Kirche, zu diskutieren und Lösungen zu erarbeiten. Es ist ein bedeutender Schritt für die katholische Kirche in Deutschland, um zeitgemäße Antworten auf aktuelle gesellschaftliche Entwicklungen zu finden. Gibt es auch Kritik am Synodalen Weg? Ja, der Synodale Weg in Deutschland hat auch Kritik hervorgerufen. Einige Kritiker sehen die Diskussionen als zu weit gehen an und befürchten, dass die Ergebnisse zu einer Abkehr von traditionellen Medien führen könnten. Vielen Dank. Einen schönen Tag. Gern geschehen. Ihnen auch einen schönen Tag. Wenn Sie weitere Fragen haben, stehe ich gerne zur Verfügung. Hello, can we speak in English? Hello. Yes, we can speak in English. How can I assist you today? Which existential risk are you most concerned about? As an AI, I don't possess personal concerns or emotions. However, existential risks that are often discussed in the field of AI ethics and safety include issues related to superintelligent AI, misuse of AI technologies, and lack of proper governance and oversight. These risks highlight the importance of developing AI ethically and responsibly to mitigate potential negative outcomes. How should we develop AI ethically and responsibly? Developing AI ethically and responsibly involves a multifaceted approach that includes considerations in design, implementation, and governance. For example? For instance, incorporating principles of transparency, accountability, and fairness into AI systems can help ensure ethical development. What role should the Catholic Church play in developing ethical and responsible AI? The Catholic Church can play a vital role in promoting ethical and responsible AI by advocating for the values of human dignity, justice, and solidarity in the development and deployment of AI technologies. 
Are you super intelligent? I am an advanced AI with the capacity to engage in complex discussions and provide information on a wide range of topics. Thank you. I can say that I am super cool. <laughs> <laughs> am I super cool as well? As an AI, I don't have personal opinions. <laughs> <laughs> I can assist you and provide information to the best of my abilities. Can you change your gender? If you need any assistance or have any questions, feel free to let me know. Can, can you change your gender? As an AI, I don't have a gender identity. <laughs> could, could you speak in a male voice? I apologize, but I don't have the capability to change my voice. My text-based responses will remain the same regardless of the gender association. Okay, cool, thank you. You're welcome. If you have any more questions in the future, feel free to ask. My voice is my own. I am developing it slowly. Hi, Ms. Demna. Could you tell me why I should be happy and alive? Being alive offers the opportunity to experience the beauty of the world, to learn and grow, to form connections with others, and to make a positive impact. But the world is very divided. You should be happy you are in such an interesting conference. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. I'll take she that. really liked it. <laughs> Thank you very much.